Welcome and happy summer. This is the 2022 grant orientation workshop for the Regional Food System Program. And um, we have a pretty full agenda today. Um, I'll do some brief introductions. And then uh, Mike Lufkin, who's the local food economy manager for King County. Um, and it work, we work closely together with um, making sure that um, the funding priorities that are part of the Regional Food System Grant Program um, are consistent and support the strategies that are contained within the local food initiative. Then we will go do a little 2021 recap uh, and a little bit of the nuts and bolts for this year's program. And then uh, Jessica Saavedra is here. She manages our member jurisdiction grant and Seattle Community Partnership grants. And she'll be introducing you uh, to those programs and the online portal um, that we'll be using. And then we've got some time for uh, Q&A at the end here. The Local Food Initiative is essentially our, our regional roadmap for our food policy in King County. It was um, developed through a stakeholder-driven process back in 2014, end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Um, and it was a, uh, the executive convened what he called the kitchen cabinet, which consisted of stakeholders from across the food system. So nonprofit organizations, uh, members of the farm and food access communities, um, academia, Washington State University, University of Washington, the private sector, and of course, um, public agencies as well. And working collaboratively, this kitchen cabinet developed um, this, this food policy roadmap that identified two goals. One is how can we increase the healthy and affordable food access for low-income populations? across the county. And the second is how do we grow a healthy and sustainable local food economy? And within the, the roadmap document are a whole series of different um, programs and uh, strategic areas that help us move us toward those two goals. Overall, there's, there's 35 different strategy areas. Um, so I, I think, you know, if, if you're putting together a proposal for the Regional Food System Grant, certainly um, it'll be helpful to go through this document and you know, spend a little time identifying you know, where you see your project or where your project fits within the context of the, of the food initiative. Um, and I can talk in a minute about uh, some of the, the more detailed areas um, in which we've seen projects in the past. So this slide just identifies, um, you know, those two food system goals um, that we have under the, the food initiative. You know, and as I mentioned, um, within each of these areas over the, the past seven years, we've seen a number of projects um, come through the and funded by the Regional Food System Grant Program to support us uh, in, in our efforts to move toward those goals. And again, I'll mention a couple of those. So, you know, I mentioned farmland access. That is always a major challenge for growers, both in rural and urban areas across uh, King County. Now, this grant program doesn't support, um, you know, the actual funding to acquire land, but it has in the past supported groups in terms of uh, building the capacity to um, think about land access opportunities. It's funded support for farm linking programs. So supporting, you know, helping farmers understand better what they're looking for in terms of land and likewise supporting um, land identification of land that's potentially farmable and could be made available to, pr to producers. Um, in terms of other strategy areas, I mentioned infrastructure. Here again, this is a, a big area that the program has funded over the course of the last seven years. Um, and by infrastructure, that could mean on-farm uh, infrastructure um, or shared infrastructure off-site, like aggregation or cold storage, um, or even um, it's funded in the past, you know, organizations that are trying to develop the strategy for how to develop these kind of infrastructure projects. So a whole host of different things under that. Uh, just one, one more example. I know it's, we've supported um, 
you know, uh, food distribution. So organizations that do, uh, that distribute local food either to the hunger relief sector or through uh, other market channels supported um, um, infrastructure that does that like trucks and vans and things like that. Uh, the third area that I'll mention is the business support and technical assistance. Uh, this is a, a major strategy identified in the, the food initiative to support farm and food businesses. And here again, um, the, the food system grant program has supported projects, um, a number of projects that support farmer business training um, and technical assistance across an array of different production and marketing um, support efforts. Um, Another area, uh, production. So like if there's in innovative production practices um, or trials that have shown success, the program has supported those or even um, you know, researching and trying to better understand production practices that could support growers across the region. You know, one example I'll give here is um, a recent project was funding the Washington Water Trust to better understand the potential of utilization of recycled water across uh, the region and kind of what the attitudes of both producers and consumers are with respect to recycled water. So a really important project that can help us better understand kind of the, the, the true viability of a program before there is significant investment in actually making something like that happen. Um, farmer training programs is another uh, area where we've seen significant investment. The food initiative has a goal of continuing to grow and, and increase the number of new and beginning farmers across the region. And so the grant program has supported organizations that um, support those those um, new and beginning farmers and specifically historically underserved uh, communities and organizations that are helping to, to grow new farmers. Um, and the grant program has funded a number of those over the years. And then the, the last area that I think I'll mention is um, market opportunities. So whether that's you know, marketing and promotion of uh, products, um, particularly for specific, you know, um, you know, co-ops or organizations that are farm groups that are coming together, um, or whether it's, you know, researching um, value chains and supply chains to better understand what opportunities might exist for, for local growers. There's been a number of, of grants over the years that support, you know, increased market development for, um, for growers across the region. Um, so those are the, the main areas, and I'm sure I've I've probably forgotten some, but um, the other couple points that I want to make is just, you know, one of the things that's been really exciting over the years is to see just the innovation um, that, that the different projects that come before the, uh, the working group we see in terms of how to think about solving some of these challenges and barriers that we face in our food system across all these issue areas that I've mentioned and how to bring new innovation to, to solving some of these challenges. The second, how do we bring in communities um, that have historically not been served by, um, you know, whether it's public agencies like King County um, that are providing services or others? How do we bring in new growers, new communities, new organizations into this? And that's something that is always a priority um, for this grant program. And then the last thing that, that's been super exciting to see over the progression of over the last seven years is kind of this, this what started off as a lot of um, individual projects. We're now seeing so many uh, innovative partnerships and you know, groups coming together to you know, uh, play on each other, each organization's strength to come together around proposals. And um, I know that, that that's something that uh, KCD in this program has tried to really support and push is creating greater partnerships and collaboration across the food system. And, 
you know, we've really seen that, I think, over the years, and hopefully we'll continue to see that going forward. And I just want to thank everybody for continuing to um, do what you do for your, with your organizations to grow and strengthen the local food system, and look forward to working with all of you um, in the future. Well, thanks, Mike. It was great to have you. Mike was saying that the, the grant program got started in 2015. And over that time, between 2015 and 2021, we have made regional food system investments in excess of $5.5 million. And that direct grant funding has leveraged an additional $3 million in cash match and uh, in-kind support. Um, we've done 86 competitive grants um, over the period and 14 strategic initiative grants. Um, the difference is, is that the competitive grants or you come to us with your great ideas and we go through a, a technical review and a working group review and then recommendations go to the, the grant subcommittee and then the board of supervisors and they basically um, work to approve or if they have questions, um, that kind of slate of candidates that, that rated highly in the, the competitive process. Uh, the strategic initiatives are intended to be longer term um, more substantial investments in like the working farmland partnership and the farm business support and technical assistance um, and some of the other strategic grants that we've given out. Um, these are just some great pictures of some of the projects that we've funded recently. Um, new tractors, high tunnels, community gardens, um, Seattle Good Business Network, um, community-based efforts to educate consumers about what grows locally. And then certainly during COVID, and uh, we've had a lot of folks that have kind of changed up their working models of how they get uh, food to local communities in need. And so there's been a lot more um, kitchen work that's been going on, which is really nice to see. Um, in 2021, um, we actually awarded uh, more competitive grants um, than we have in the past. And I think as, as Mike was saying is that um, we've really worked hard to engage other kind of traditionally underserved communities, and we didn't have any um, BIPOC-led uh, community organizations applying in 2015 when the grant first started, and over half of the awards uh, last year were to those, those communities that um, haven't, haven't really had full access to those programs. Uh, all these are on the website. I encourage you to go look uh, every grant that we've awarded since 2015 is on there and you can kind of get an idea. Also make sure that you read the RFP. It's got a lot of detail in it and I'm just gonna hit some of the high points. Um, if you do go through the process and you get an award, we'll be holding another uh, virtual workshop about you know, how you do your progress report, how you do your uh, reimbursement request, the documentation that you need to have and things like that, because I think that'll be a little more helpful for folks instead of trying to, you know, kind of get it one large set of people at one time, and then you can always come to me with questions because that's that's what I do. Um, so in 2022, we have $300,000 for competitive grants. Um, we worked with the grant subcommittee and the working group to actually increase the level of funding from last year. Uh, so it's up uh, to a maximum award of $50,000 from $20,000. Um, eligibility is like you have to be within the district service area. That's also on the website, but there's 34 jurisdictions in all of unincorporated King County that are part of the district's boundaries. Um, there's a few places like Milton and Enumclaw um, that are not part of the district. And so funding can't happen in those areas. Um, it's okay to be located outside King County as long as the, most of the activity is happening within King County, because that's the intention of the grant. And so a wide swath of farmers, producer organizations, marketers, Mike alluded to all this too. It's, it's been, a, there's a ton of stakeholders out there and, and we've um, increased participation over the years. And so um, those eligibility requirements are spelled out in detail in the, on the website and in the RFP. Um, you must demonstrate a public benefit. It can't go, the project, whatever you're funding can't be for the sole benefit of like a single producer. Um, it has to show that greater public benefit. So if you're helping producer groups, like so we've, we've funded 
um, look at educational projects. We've funded, you know, uh, kind of the second generation of farm incubators that are serving more than one uh, producer or producer group groups, and that that. So that's that's important. Um, we won't be buying you a tractor as an individual farmer. <laughs> it's got to it's got to be more shared shared equipment. Um, match is required. So cash match, in kind match, some of both. Um, we just want to see that that the community that you're and that's kind of where these partnerships come into play as well as is we want to demonstrate some kind of contribution on the part of the organization or their stakeholder groups um, to actually contribute uh, to the, the overall uh, project itself. Um, we strongly encourage those. I think I'm just going to emphasize what you know Mike was saying over the years is that we really have seen um, kind of what was a disparate group of, of organizations coming in and and over that's those seven years is we really seen in, uh, a tremendous increase in partnerships. Um, the district is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. Um, again, this is outlined uh, more in the, the grant application materials itself, um, but we, we wanna know how you're doing that broader outreach to communities that have been traditionally underserved or not had, had uh, access. Um, to funding programs like this one or to other resources in the community to help support those um, marketing efforts, farmer efforts, um, production efforts, et cetera. Um, measurable outcomes, extremely important. So we want to know kind of more than just the outputs, like you're, you know, if you're going to do a workshop and it's going to have, you know, 30 participants or whatever, we want to know kind of what the expectations for whatever educational efforts or um, infrastructure investments that you're making um, are going to have. And it could be, you know, one to three years, it could be over five years, but certainly, you know, we've, we've funded a number of like greenhouse and high tunnels, irrigation projects, um, lots of different infrastructure that's gonna, you know, or cold storage, freezer storage, um, things that are gonna have a longer term impact on whoever that, that farming community or marketing community is that, that you're serving. And so some of those, can include like, again, going back to farmland access is what, what's the new acres in production? Sometimes it's small, if it's a community garden, they're gonna bring, you know, so many, you know, hundred of square feet in, or it could be a number of acres by bringing, you know, some larger tract of uh, land back into production. Dollars of new sales, dollars of new farmers, farm businesses, um, and then address those key funding priorities. Uh, Mike highlighted those. I think the one that I didn't hear in there was food safety. So we have funded food safety projects in the past, both GAP and GIP and HACCP. And so all those fun acronyms, but um, food safety is important. And especially in the time of COVID, it's, it's particularly important. Um, proposals are due July 18th. Um, we'll, we'll make announcements after the Board of Supervisors approves the roster of recommended projects. That'll be in October. And then we'll have a like I said, a new grantee orientation workshop sometime in November after things you know, get settled down and the announcements have been made and stuff like that so that um, we can get everybody on the same page uh, about reporting. Um, so these are just some examples of infrastructure. I think Mike hit on them really well. Produce processing, aggregation, distribution, value added, uh, cold storage, irrigation, all those kinds of things. Consumer demand, um, eat local promotions, uh, farm, farmer buyer trade meetings, you know, farmers market promotions. We've done a lot with um, the Office of Sustainability and Environment early on in the pro, uh, program to uh, increase access to local food, particularly for low income communities and the distribution of fresh bucks and some work around um, uh, working on emerging market opportunities. And again, some of that has happened during COVID, um, which has been interesting to see in terms of, um, you know, people changing up what they've been doing to, to reach more people or, you know, to reach communities and do it with PPE and all those other good things. So uh, land access, again, Mike went over this really well, uh, farm link properties ac accessing new. And part of this is also the county um, has access to farmland and they've been really focused on getting um, 
increased access for particularly BIPOC and immigrant refugee communities. And they, they play a really critical role in, in all this work as well. Uh, business management, we talked some about that. And then uh, this year's strategic initiatives that this has been, been again, a stakeholder-based process. And um, the working farmland access is actually it's in its second year of funding. Uh, the farm business support and technical assistance is in its second year of funding. Uh, an immigrant refugee farmer outreach coordinator. Uh, that's a position in King County to basically help with that, um, getting those communities access to the county's farmland in particular, but to other available working agricultural lands as well. Um, Value-based supply chain coordination. Um, there's been you know, several projects in the past looking at that and how we really get our arms around that and what does that look like. And then a dairy initiative to support um, our remaining dairies in King County um, that hopefully we'll be working on all those things this year. Hi everybody, I'm Jessica Saavedra. I manage the member jurisdiction grant program at KCD and I'm going to show you how to apply for a regional food system grant in our online grant portal and I'm just going to kind of walk you through the process of how to get there and what you should be seeing when you're in the portal. There it is. Seeing when it works. <laughs> Zoom sometimes is not our friend. It's just, it's not. Definitely not. So Jessica, if you wanna still narrate to people um, and I can just scroll through the website and take them to the page. Okay, so, um, from the main KCD page, you can either um, go down to the very bottom of the page and click on grants in the tools and resources. You can also search with that little search thing up in the upper right side. Um, but this will get you by clicking on the grants at the bottom of the page. Then there you'll see the three different grant programs and the the Regional Food System Grant Program is what we're talking about today. All three grant programs are on our online grant portal. Um, so this is where you're going to want to go to read the grant program guidelines. And we strongly encourage you to read through those documents that we have. Um, there's a video tutorial about how to get started with the portal. It's helpful um, if you have never logged in before to just give that a quick watch. It's really short. And then we'd like you to review the application guide and we have um, where we have some of the policies and requirements that Mary talked about and the local food initiative actions as well. And then the additional guidance document has um, specific help for answering the individual questions in the application. And it has, um, yeah, it has examples of answers just to help people in the application process. And then there's some download forms down here. Um, these can also be downloaded within the portal. So you can um, download them here and start getting working on them. And then you can, when you're in the application in the portal, you can upload them. Um, so there's, it, there's a couple different options for you here. But uh, when you're ready to apply, you're gonna wanna click on the apply now button on our page. And that'll get you to the portal. And um, this is where you'll need to decide if you've already had a KCD grant through the portal that you've applied for, and you can use your same login credentials for that. If you have not applied in the portal before, then you'll wanna create a new account. And um, so, depending on, and so the video on the website shows you how to create a new account. Um, 
so it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, Mark, did you have a login to the portal? Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's exactly what's supposed to happen. Um, so instead of, so it basically, when you click on that link from our webpage, it'll take you directly to the portal and the application for the regional food system. So that's where we want you to go if that's the program that you're planning on applying to. So um, this is what you'll see when you um, log in and it'll jump you right into the application and you can start filling it out. It will save any entries. It will save them automatically. And, um, and you can also see that little button that says question list on the sort of bottom right hand side of the page. Um, that's where you can print out the list of questions that's in the portal. Like some people like to download that and then work on a Word document with their answers and then copy and paste your answers from your Word document into the application. Um, that's just a little extra thing that people do. Um, so Mark, if you wanna just scroll down a little bit, you can see the grant application. And then you can see these blue links. Um, and that's where you can download the necessary form. So you, um, if you didn't download it from our webpage, you can download it from inside the application. So I'm trying to make everything really easy so you don't have to keep coming and going from the portal. Um, and then when you, um, if you ever, lose where your application is or where um, it go if you click on the house icon on the upper left side it's next to the kcd logo that takes you back to your applicant dashboard and um and there you'll see if you started an application it'll be down there um if you scroll down a little bit mark it will show your active request there if you started typing in it. Um, and that's where you can go back to return to working on it. Um, so yeah, I think that's the main thing. I mean, you can also click on your organization history to see if there's what other applications may have been submitted by your organization if you're already in, if they're already in the portal. Um, so yeah, Mark, if you can go back, click on apply. Um, yeah, click on apply. And so if you scroll down just a little bit more, you'll see the other grant program available to apply for through the portal. And I see some notes in the chat about this. Um, so the member jurisdiction grant program is also open for applications through the same portal. Um, the member jurisdiction grant program is for cities and nonprofits who are partnering with cities. So it's very specific to those types of applicants. Um, so um, most people here today should pursue the regional food system grant program if their project aligns with that. And if you have a project that's um, different and is related to a city partnership, then you'll wanna contact me and talk about that and about applying in the process for this other grant program. Uh, we also have a Seattle Community Partnership grant process that's been closed and we've already awarded grants for this year for that process. So you won't see that here, but, um, and we will be able to tell like if somebody starts filling out the wrong application, we'll be able to tell and we'll contact you if we think maybe you're applying for the wrong program. But as, as long as you click that link from the grant uh, webpage, then you will get to the right place. Uh, so just double check when you're going 
to the various pages that you're in the regional food page because we do have a few other grant programs that people can get kind of confused with. So um, this is where you wanna go when you first start and you'll click that blue apply button and start the process from there. And there's contact information throughout the application as well if anybody has any questions. And then once awards are made, this is the same place where grant progress reports and reimbursement requests will be submitted. So um, this is a all encompassing grant life cycle management database. And um, that's it as far as uh, the portal and getting there, it's pretty easy. And of course, I'm available with any questions. I can, I'm happy to walk people through it um, in a quick Zoom meeting or whatever people need. Um, we, can, we can take some questions if anybody has questions in the audience. So match is required, cash, in-kind, or some amount of both. There is no set level of match. Um, we just want to see that you have some. And that'll all have to be as part of uh, reporting if you get an award um, is that you'll have to have documentation for that. So if if it's in kind, for example, if you have a community garden or you're using volunteer labor, um, just making sure that those hours are documented. If you're doing um, some kind of, of uh, staff match um, and are using grant funding for that, you'll have to have documentation for that. Um, I will say right now that one of the important things about the budget, and Jessica will get to here in a minute, is that for the grant funded portion of your project, overhead or administrative costs cannot exceed 25% of that staffing budget that you're saying that you're gonna use KCD funding for. So it's the less of two things, it's either 25% or if you're gonna itemize, uh, you know, if you've got a shared IT position or, you know, a Zoom account or something like that is that you'll just have to itemize it basically. And it's the less of both of those things. And a lot of folks get stuck there when they don't have any staffing level and yet they're, they're trying to ask for overhead. So that's, that's just the rule there. And that's in the documentation for the grant application as well. In terms of the when KCD started using the portal for grants was 2017. Uh, we got the system in 2016 and then we imported all the data from the years and years and years of member jurisdiction and RIA grants in there. So it, it took a little time and that's what we're planning on doing with the regional food data. Uh, we're gonna load all of the previous grants into the portal so we can have all of our grant history in one place. Um, let's see. Um, so for the member jurisdiction grants, which is for the cities and partnering nonprofits, that's open year round. So applications can be submitted at any time and then we just work them into our grant subcommittee review and board meeting schedules. Um, you have to have a relationship with a city, one of the 35 cities to do that. And they, cities authorize nonprofits to apply. Um, KCD has 35 different buckets of money for projects in partnership with the 35 jurisdictions that are part of the district. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities for funding in various different cities, but you do have to have a relationship with the city set up to get that going. But yeah, definitely contact me with questions about that. And I can even connect you with some city contacts if you're interested. Yeah, and it looks like, so I'll, I'll put the link to the member jurisdiction grant webpage in the chat. And that's where you'll find a similar kind of layout as the regional food system, but it'll be different requirements and with the emphasis on cities. One thing I would add is that um, the member jurisdiction grants do fund quite a bit of food related activities. Um, and the main difference is that those are projects led by cities 
and jurisdictions. So um, some examples are like farmers markets. We fund several around the region and um, and there's all kinds of different exciting things that cities are doing. Uh, and we're paying for, so for example, Des Moines farmers market. They have a token program where they give senior low income seniors tokens to buy fresh produce at and um, healthy food at the farmer's market there. And um, so that's just an example of the different kinds of partnerships that we're that we have through the member jurisdiction grant program. So there was a question about fiscal sponsorship that won't necessarily apply to everybody. Um, I'm just going to use a specific example because it's so much easier. So Sustainable Seattle has a number of small uh, community-based projects that they are a fiscal sponsor for so that the organization that is reporting to Sustainable Seattle um, probably doesn't have their 501c3 with the Secretary of State. Um, and so really you only need that if, if you have somebody that's kind of in a fiduciary role for your organization before you've incorporated as a nonprofit or you know a cooperative or whatever other business form you're taking on. So um, you may be the organization that's actually doing the real project, but if, if you rely on for somebody else for that fiduciary responsibility, then you need to upload that fiscal sponsor letter. Also, if that's another thing that I reinforce with um, Jessica is that um, if you're on property that you don't own and control, so if you're leasing it from somebody, I know a lot of our uh, community garden projects are like this, um, is that you will need a letter from the landowner that basically says, yes, they in fact support the project that you're doing. Um, and you'll upload that in the, in the portal as well. So um, yeah, um, again, you know, if you have burning questions, just reach out and we'll try to respond to everybody. 